Epicurus designed a philosophy for life that he believed would help all people live happy and a pleasurable life. He wrote, by pleasure, we mean the absence of pain in the body and trouble in the soul. Now, to be fair, he wasn't advocating an unbroken succession of drinking bouts and of reverie, not sexual love, not the enjoyment of the fish and other delicacies of a luxurious table, which produce a pleasant life. As Paul Copan and Kenneth Litwack write in The Gospel in the Marketplace of Ideas, the goal of Epicureanism was to live a life and maximize pleasure and friendship which were the ideal values. This involved withdrawing from civic activities. Epicurus also taught the importance of foregoing immediate pleasures for more long-term pleasures in the future. The life of pleasure must be marked by wisdom and justice. The core concept for Epicurus was atomism. Everything, including the soul and the gods, was made of indivisible particles known as atoms, which were always in motion. Things were formed when atoms collided and stayed together. These collisions, however, were not uniform, but random. Epicurus called the random movement of atoms the swerve, and he taught that the swerve means that everyone has free will. Furthermore, Epicurus taught that matter was eternal, uncreated, and not endowed with any divine purpose. Epicurus sought to remove the fear of death. He taught that the soul does not survive death, but that the atoms of a person's soul disintegrate at death. There was no place in this system for bodily resurrection or even future spiritual existence. The Epicureans also taught that the gods made of immortal matter existed in a place of supreme pleasure, but did not interfere in human affairs. And this belief would release an adherent from both fear of the supernatural now and judgment in the afterlife. This provided the grounds for functional atheism. There may be gods or goddesses, but they are irrelevant to our existence, and therefore, belief in their existence was of no significance. This is another similarity with our modern culture. Much of modern atheism, if, if we don't take into account the rancorous and vitriolic uh, speech of people such as Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and Lawrence Krauss, could be described as mildly apathetic or soft atheism. The notion or idea is that you can believe in God if you want, but that's just not for me. However, much like Epicureanism, there are several flaws embedded in this thinking. The first one, which I won't handle in detail in this video, is that when deciding what to believe or allow others to believe, the standard should not be opinion or preference. Some beliefs are true and some beliefs are false. Furthermore, there are philosophical standards for how we determine the efficacy of ideas, beliefs, and facts. For more on how to arrive at truth, there is a link to a previous video here below. Right now, I only want to deal with some other issues that parallel what Epicurus taught. First, the goal of Epicureanism was to live a happy life and maximize pleasures and friendships, which were the ideal values. Although it's admirable to live a happy life with your friends, the reality of such a lifestyle has seemed to elude every person ever in the history of humanity. Forever, 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 ever, forever, ever. Therefore, we need to ask why that is. We also need to define what it means to be happy. What if what makes you happy makes someone else unhappy? This would mean that you would be denying said person what Epicurus called the ideal values. Does your happiness supersede someone else's pain? Should life's goal be oriented towards a pursuit of happiness or a pursuit of truth? The one question I ask people who are not Christians is this. If Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had atheists stand at microphones in front of hundreds of people on college campuses. I ask them that question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And they say, no. And I go, no? How's that reasonable? How's that rational? It's not. See, most of us, we're not on a truth quest, we're on a happiness quest. Is happiness an objective reality? No. Therefore, how does one know if he or she is progressing towards that end? If we remove God from the equation as the foundation upon which we ground and build our life, many things get left in limbo, such as happiness, the meaning of life, morality, and the moral law. 
Not only does naturalism lack the means to ground a moral law, it cannot fulfill the desire one has to grow or become more moral. If transformation is the goal, there must be a telos or a purpose. Whether transformation has taken place cannot be accurately assessed unless there's a target for one to aim at. Naturalism cannot tell a man where to direct his moral growth. Therefore, he never knows if he arrives. Baggett and Walls write, Despite the prodigious efforts of some secularists to retain the category of a human telos, Daniel Dennett assumes that, on naturalism, all ultimate explanations must be mechanistic. So that the teleological, where it occurs, must be explained in mechanistic terms. This is potentially question begging on his part, but it is also just where the theist would demur and reverse the order. See, without a goal, naturalistic moral transformation is reduced to moral pragmatism. A constantly shifting goalpost further impacts any process of moral transformation. What some people used to consider morally acceptable hundreds of years ago, i.e. slavery, is no longer deemed morally acceptable. And while this is a valid and life-affirming change, it demonstrates that the moral code written by men and nations is anything but objective. This leaves morality, meaning, and thereby happiness as terms with their feet firmly planted in midair. Second, the core concept of Epicurus was atomism. Recall what Copan and Litwack wrote. Everything, including the soul and the gods, was made of indivisible particles known as atoms, which were always in motion. Now let's assume for a moment that this were true. That would reduce humans to mere meat computers. We would solely be a collection of atoms and the same would be true for our brain. The mind, which is a non-physical reality, meaning not composed of atoms, would have to cease to exist under such a paradigm. And I won't even address the glaring contradiction in Epicurus's line of thought when he states everything, including the soul and the gods, was made of indivisible particles known as atoms. The soul and God are not made of atoms. If you believe that either one exists, they only exist in contradistinction to the physical world. One of these things is not like the others. Which one is different? Do you know? Moving on. If all that is real is the material world, things that one can see, feel, or observe, then there are no immaterial realities. However, the rules of logic and knowledge themselves are immaterial realities. Furthermore, why should one suppose that his or her brain, which blindly originates from more simple species and originally from energy, is a trustworthy source for even engaging in epistemological endeavors? Charles Darwin, who many would consider the father of macroevolutionary theory, once wrote, but then with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? Valid question. Gardner notes, Darwin used and trusted his mind in developing his theory of evolution, but when his mind suggested the idea of a creator, he suddenly could not trust his mind. <laughs> Funny how that works. This brings to light one glaring issue for naturalism and specifically for naturalistic philosophers. The question is not does naturalism provide valid answers, but can such a worldview even justify asking the questions? Alvin Plantinga said that in philosophy, knowledge is warranted true belief. And a belief has warrant for some person if and only if that belief was formed by cognitive faculties that are functioning properly and in accordance with a good design plan in a cognitive environment appropriate for the way those faculties were designed and when the design plan for our faculties is aimed at obtaining truth. So then the question then arises, does naturalism profess a good design plan where cognitive faculties can grow? Moreland responds, now, the notion of proper function understood as functioning the way something ought to function makes clear sense for artifacts that are designed by intelligence. Why? Because the claim that something functions the way it ought to is easily understood in terms of functioning the way it was designed to function. The naturalist owes us an account of what it would mean for humans to have properly functioning cognitive and sensory faculties that can avoid the idea of a designer 
and says Planiga, those accounts have not been successful. This would imply that a prerequisite for sound reasoning can only be sustained in a theistic framework, where a designer is present. This also violates the law of non-contradiction, because to claim that immaterial realities do not exist, while using immaterial realities to prove that only natural realities exist, is inherently contradictory. If minds exist, God exists. If souls exist, God exists. Third, Epicurus taught that matter was eternal, uncreated, and not endowed with any divine purpose. Epicurus sought to remove the fear of death. He taught that the soul does not survive death, but that the atoms of a person's soul disintegrate at death. Now, I can understand wanting to remove any fear of death. That's a noble undertaking. However, it does not give one the right to make unfounded opinions the standard for reality. Additionally, I speak and write a lot about purpose. You can join the blog. The link is below. But I always find it odd when atheists make it their life's work to teach people that there is no purpose to life. It's almost as if they feel that telling people such things is their life's purpose. Once again, a soul has no atoms, and therefore the soul cannot disintegrate, although your flesh will disintegrate. Furthermore, matter cannot be eternal and was at some point in the distant past created. For more on that, you can watch these videos with notable particle physicist Dr. Michael Strauss and astrophysicist Dr. Hugh Ross. The links are in the description. Long story short, scientists have proven that time, space, and matter came into being at a definite moment in time. And since science is essentially the study of cause and effect, we can reason from effect to cause in order to understand the origins of what we're observing. In this case, the effect is that time, space, and matter exist. Therefore, whatever caused space, time, and matter must itself be spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. Who's that sound like? Your soul is real and it will live on. Please think through where that will be and live accordingly. Finally, the Epicureans also taught that the gods made of immortal matter existed in a place of supreme pleasure but did not interfere in human affairs. Now, many people today want to believe that they are free to make the moral and lifestyle choices of their choosing. They don't like the idea of a god interfering in their lives or being invested in how they live and why. They want complete autonomy. In essence, they want to be a god unto themselves. We tend to think that freedom is the ability to do what we want, to be who we want to be, and to go where we want to go. Often, that is the case. But just as often, we realize that a complete lack of parameters doesn't actually make us as free as we thought. It tends to trap us in the paralysis of indecision or the uncertainty of a life without boundaries. Tim Keller said, because a fish absorbs oxygen from water, not air, it is free only if it is restricted to water. If a fish is freed from the water and put on the grass to explore, its freedom to move and soon live is destroyed. Real freedom is finding the right restrictions. True freedom requires saying no to certain desires and yes to other desires. Now, although most modern atheists and skeptics have probably never heard of Epicurus, the fruits of his thoughts and ideas are alive and well. Perhaps it's time they were put away for good. Peace.